Hey, we're glad to see you on our another shocking story. Enjoy watching. Martin walked slowly to the bus stop. It was Thursday, and he still had two days of work to do, when he would have gladly said goodbye to his factory to spend the weekend without it. For many years now, the man had worked at the caravan trailers, as the former Southwold plant was called. It had once rattled the entire Soviet Union. They produced good quality trailers for KMA Z trucks, so those who were in the know bought them for their business and personal use. But, as everywhere, times have changed, and the former large plant was emptied. Not that it was completely closed, but many buildings were rented by furniture factories and plastic window manufacturers. In general, the big for the city production was closed. The administration tried to keep the fire burning, so Martin stayed. He used to have a good position by those standards. He even managed to work as chief engineer for a while. But the plant quickly began to decline, and the chief engineer began to lose its relevance. The man returned to his former post and worked for a few more years as an engineer, but the decline could not be prevented. So Martin was forced to combine in his person both an engineer, a fitter, and a mechanic. For so many years, the man was so accustomed to his plant that he agreed to such conditions, but every year the work was given harder and harder. Not only age, but also great disappointment. A bus arrived, a twenty, and the man entered it. There were no free seats, and he nestled at the end of the cabin near the window. It was rush hour, and there was no point in waiting for another. Freer bus. Martin stared blankly out the window. There was a traffic jam on the bypass, as usual. The man sighed with frustration. This is how it is in my life, he thought. Every day I run into the same traffic jam, but I still can't decide to take a new route. How much more patience do I have? Sometimes I think I'll just give it all up in an instant because I can't take it anymore. Martin was originally from Southwold. His neighborhood, once, like many others in the region, had prospered from collective and state farms. Not to say that the young lad's parents were wealthy people, but his father told his son at once that he should get an education. Alex's older sister lived in Sverdlovsk. There he also wanted to send his son to study at the institute. Aunt Martina promised to shelter the boy for the duration of his studies at her place, and that meant that the boy was never hungry, always wore good clothes that Aunt Katie bought for him. It was hard to say what the young man wanted then, but Martin didn't really want to study engineering, and he didn't want to leave his native village. And it would have been all right. Maybe Martin would have stayed in Shields, which he got used to if there had not been one but. Andrew Wolf was the village administrator at the time. He held on to his post with a deadly grip. Of course, he did a little something for himself now and then. He had a daughter, beautiful Molly. She was in Martin's class. She had been in love with Martin for many years, and the older she got, the more she began to think about marrying him. The fact that he had gone to Shields to study didn't bother her much. He usually came home for the vacations, and they saw each other often. You don't need him. Andrew scolded his daughter. There are so many good guys out there, and you're clinging to your Martin like a bulldog that it's impossible to tear you away. He was angry. Daddy, I love him, she sobbed. If I ever marry, it will only be to him. Long tried to change Marina's mind, but nothing helped, and he went to Alex. Hello, Alex. He greeted the combined harvester. I have a serious conversation with you. What's up, Andrew? The man wondered. Do they want to check the fields again? No, I'm here on personal business, he said dryly. I need to talk to you about Martin. About Martin? Surprised, the combined harvester asked. Well, let's go and talk. What's wrong with my Martin? Alex, you're a good man. The village administrator started from afar. You don't drink much, and your son is a smart guy. I'm thinking about something. Why don't we marry Martin and Molly? My daughter's not only beautiful, but she's a hard worker. No bad deeds to speak of. Do you want to marry your Molly to my Martin? Alex looked at him in amazement. He still has two years to study. Molly loves him so much that she'll wait. Wolf smiled. Besides, 
I won't hurt them, you know me. They'll be like cheese and butter. Andrew. I don't know. Martin's father scratched his head. He hadn't thought of marriage yet, or anything else for that matter. Maybe he's got someone in shields. Do you think he's telling me about it? Laughed the combine harvester. Lesh, well, you talk to him. His father looked at him carefully. Explain everything to him. He will listen to you. There's no reason for him to go to foreign lands if he has such a bride waiting for him at home. Martin's father was puzzled by the conversation with the administrator. Not that he was against Molly, but he would have liked his son to make his own choice. Alex, I think Wolf is right. Martin's mother Eva supported the administrator. Let him come home. Alex will give him a good place here. With his education, everything is possible here. And Molly is a good girl. Done. What if he already has someone there? Objected the father. We'd spoil the guy's plans for life. So what? She replied coldly. You'd rather have your son here, at your side, in a good position, or in some unknown place carrying sacks. You're the father. You talk to him about it. For a long time, Alex put off this conversation with his son. It was getting close to New Year's Eve when he called him. Well, son, don't you miss home? The father asked cautiously. What are your plans there after graduation? Honestly speaking, I'm bored, replied the son. I've gotten used to shields over the years, but I'm still drawn back home. As for plans, I don't know yet. Well, maybe you have some job in mind. Alex continued, or a serious relationship. I have neither. Martin answered with annoyance in his voice. I think about it all the time myself. I look at job ads to see what they can offer here. Martin, what do you think of Molly Wolf? The man couldn't help himself. She's a good girl. And do you know who her father is? What's Molly got to do with it? I don't get it, kid dad. I don't get it. Son, we just found out that Molly's been in love with you for a long time, he said quietly. So we thought you'd make a good couple. Dad, I don't think of her as my girlfriend, Martin laughed. Honestly, I've never even thought about it. But look at her, son, his father insisted. Wolf promises you a good position. What's going on? You've already made up your mind without me, he said, but then added more calmly. All right, I'll think about it. I'll probably go home anyway. Martin shuddered. The bus driver braked sharply, and the man cursed to himself. But it was all over, and he stared out the window again. Behind him showed the trees, from which the strong Stavropol wind plucked autumn leaves. That's it. Soon another year will be over. The man whispered with annoyance in his voice. And the next year I'll be fifty-five. How quickly old age has come, he sighed. Martin sank back into his thoughts. The bus was taking him to the northwest, and he knew the route by heart. After the session in his fourth year, Martin came home. He had already given his father his consent, so all their relatives were preparing for the matchmaking. I don't feel like marrying Molly, the boy said hesitantly. I don't love her, but maybe that's the way it is. First you don't love her, and then you love her. Well, son, his father said to him a few days later, are you ready for the matchmaking? Oh, dad, I don't know. The son honestly admitted, I can't get my foot in Molly's house. It'll all blow over, his mother assured him. Do you think I married your father for love? Rarely do people marry for love. I think that true love comes later, when you already have a family. But your father and I have lived together for many years, and I wouldn't trade him for anyone else. The matchmaking was a big deal. We couldn't make a big deal out of it in front of the village administrator. Martin's uncle was a big talker. He had a good tongue, as they say. He kept his mouth shut during the whole matchmaking, so it was fun. Well, Martin, my son, Wolf hugged him. Molly will be waiting for you for a year, and next August we'll be married. Molly was incredibly beautiful. She stood in a soft pink dress and kept lowering her eyes in embarrassment. Can't we really? Everything will work out, and we'll have a good life. Looking at the girl, thought the boy. Molly is really very beautiful. After the matchmaking the young people began to meet, 
they needed to get to know each other better. Martin told her stories of his life in Shields. The girl listened to them with interest. Molly talked about their life in the village, told her boyfriend about her dreams. You know, Martin, I want our children to stay in the village and run their own business, just as we did, said the girl with tenderness in her voice. Molly, some of them will want to study, and some of them will even be against staying here and will go to the city. The boy objected to her. Yes, I understand, Molly sighed. You see, I'd like to build a family nest, so that our chicks wouldn't leave it, she laughed. Molly was ordinary in Martin's eyes. She wasn't educated, Wolf wouldn't let her go to town, but she had a kind of wisdom. She was easy for a guy to be with. By the end of the summer, Martin even thought he was in love with Marina. When the guy went back to Shields, they talked almost every day on the phone that his aunt had in her apartment, and Martin got so used to it that when one important event happened in his life, he was just completely out of his depth, never thought about it. One day he made a promise to himself that the man had kept for years. The bus turned onto Youth Avenue, and Martin caught up. He got off at the stop and headed toward the stoplight. He needed to get to the other side of Rachel Avenue. And there, he could say, he was already at work. The man pulled out his pass and walked through the gatehouse. A crowd was already gathering in the lobby, all in a hurry to get to work. Martin stepped outside and went to his building. Martin, hello. The director ran up to him. Well, what about the order? Do we have all the details ready? Yes. Bob and I finished the 20th of 30 blanks yesterday, he said, so we should probably be done by today and tomorrow. Well, all right, smiled the chief. You let me know when it's ready. The man nodded his head and walked toward the workroom. There already sat his partner who had changed clothes. Well, Bob, said Martin, can we finish it today and tomorrow? If not, the guy smiled broadly. Martin. Frankly speaking, I'm already tired of these blanks. These blanks are so uncomfortable to work with. The man and the boy went into the shop and started up their machines. Martin went back into his thoughts. Son, do you want me to refuse Wolf now? His father shouted angrily, speaking to Martin on the phone. No, that's not going to happen. The wedding will be in August, just like we planned. The boy returned home with a heavy heart. After his diploma defense the next day, he invited his aunt to a cafe as a thank you. But after another day, he left quickly. He never came to Shields after that. The wedding was very expensive. Volkov was marrying off his only daughter. So, despite all his greed, he organized the celebration with all the scope. Almost the whole village was at the wedding. Molly signed the papers at the registry office and looked happily at the guests. Martinishka. I'm so happy, she whispered to the groom. I will never forget this day. The guy also realized that he would never forget this day. Only unlike his bride, it was the most mournful day of his life. A few years passed. Martin worked as an engineer in the administration of the village council. He and Molly had a good life. In time the guy, if I may say so, settled down, appreciated Molly, and began to feel happy too. Everything would have been great, but as often happens in such cases, there was one but. The young people could not have children. What the reason was, no one knew. They'd been to Southwold and Rochester, but all the doctors said it was too soon. Two years wasn't long enough for a family. But then five years went by, and seven years went by, and ten years went by. Molly came in crying one day. Martin. I can't go on like this, she sobbed. I beg you, let's get away from here. People's tongues are driving me mad with their gossip. I don't want to see anyone else here. People were cruel to other people's grief. Every now and then someone offered one version or another of why Molly and Martin had no children. That's what she should do, the women said. Her father had stolen so much for himself in his time. Now she's working off his sins. Aha, he used to walk around here with his belly up. Neighbors supported the conversation. He looked down on everyone. And as for pitying someone, 
he would sink that person, on the contrary. And I heard that Martin is walking away from Molly. An elderly man intervened in the conversation. He found someone from the neighboring village. That's why they have no children, because they sleep in separate beds at night. Molly's father didn't have as much power as he used to. He'd resigned as administrator, and he couldn't shut his mouth to anyone else. He realized that Molly was suffering in the village. Everyone had turned against her in an instant. All right, Molly, Wolf once said to his daughter, sell the house here and buy yourself an apartment in Southwold. I'll give you some extra money. Martin was so used to his life in the village that he didn't really want to go to the city, and all the hustle and bustle of the capital bored him. But seeing the suffering of his wife, the man finally agreed to move. So in Martin's life appeared trailers, where he worked for almost twenty years. Bob, drop everything, let's go to lunch, the man shouted to his partner. It's after two o'clock in the afternoon. Well, we've been working hard today. The guy laughed as they went into the room. Martin, I want to give you a treat today. Bobby smiled, taking can after can out of the bag. My mom told me to give you this. It's her famous tomatoes in tomato juice and some other delicious winter vegetables. Oh my God. And two jars of raspberry jam. I almost forgot. Oh, Bob, thank you, the man said. And to your mother, thank you very much from me. How I missed such homemade goodies. You know, since my mom died two years ago, I've never tasted such delicacies. You're welcome. Eat up. The boy was happy. For a man like you, it's not a pity. You know, I'm lucky to have you. You never scold me. You don't stand over my head. You don't meddle in my life. The workers ate lunch and talked for about half an hour, then went back to their machines. The time for the work ran away unnoticed. It's fifteen to five. The foreman looked at his watch. Bob. Well, let's finish up. There's seven billets left for tomorrow. I think we'll be done with them by four o'clock. The man and the boy went out through the gatehouse into the street together. Bob walked in the opposite direction. He lived in the neighborhood. Martin walked to the bus stop. Another day gone, he thought, shivering in the cold southwold wind. Now I, I can't wait for the bus to come. I just have to make it through another Friday. The same twenty came, and the man boarded it. It was crowded again. The passenger stood in the aisle, he hung on the bar, and immersed himself. It was already dark outside, and Martin closed his eyes from fatigue. Suddenly someone shoved him, and there was a clinking of cans. Oh God, I wish they hadn't broken. The man pulled the bag to his chest. Such wealth should be protected. He smiled. The bus seemed to go on forever. It took about an hour and a half when it finally appeared in the southwest. Martin got out of it with a lurch and walked toward his apartment building. He entered the entryway, which immediately smelled old and damp. Why is there no aroma of congestion for these old entrances? The man clamped his nose. Sometimes, there's just nothing to breathe in here. Martin went into the house and changed his clothes. His stomach rumbled so much that he didn't bother with any formalities. He opened a can of tomatoes and reached in with his hand. How delicious, said the man. It's been a long time since I've had such a delicious meal. Where were my fried potatoes in the fridge? Together, it will be a real bomb. Martin ate dinner, washed the dishes and sat down on his favorite sofa. TV was sometimes a real outlet for him. Not that he was involved in all the political squabbles, but watching some movies made him forget his loneliness. The man glanced at the sideboard, where a photograph of his wife, Molly, stood in the most prominent position. Since her move to Southwold, Molly had been trying to get a job somewhere. Staying at home in the apartment was very hard for her. They did not have a cottage or any kind of farm. And this made the woman even more discouraged. She dreamed of having children, but she and her husband still had no luck. Maybe from homesickness, maybe from the fact that Molly could not be realized as a mother, the woman began to fade. At first Martin thought his wife was really depressed, so he often sent her home to her father, but it didn't help. Volkov was also very worried about his daughter. 
Molly began to be taken first to doctors, then to all sorts of women. But the woman never recovered. At 42, Molly died. She was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Martin suffered a lot at first. He had grown so used to his Molly over the years that he couldn't imagine his life without her. The man often sat silently for hours in his apartment. Only work saved him. But the weekend came, and everything began again. Wolf insisted that his daughter was buried in the village, so Martin did not come to her often. And as time went on, he realized he had to let it all go. Otherwise his life would end just as soon. Martin took the picture of his wife in his hands, looked at it carefully. Molly was so beautiful in it, her face lit up with a smile. Would she be alive now if we hadn't moved to the city? Was the question that had been on his mind all these years. That night the man didn't sleep well. A longing came over him, and by midnight tears began to choke him. Martin cried both for his Molly and for himself. He was left alone, needing no one. Five years ago his father died first, and a couple years ago his mother died as well. He had no sisters or brothers. His father's older sister from Sverdlovsk was still alive, but that topic was closed for the man once and for all. The next morning Martin looked at himself in the mirror in horror. His eyes were puffy. Oh my God! It's like I've been drinking all night, said the dream in shock. And I have to go to work today. He tried some kind of massage, and after an hour his eyes looked better. Martin got dressed and walked to his bus stop. And that morning it was the same as always. The bus took him to work and left. The man crossed Kulakova Avenue and went through the gatehouse. Martin, are you sick? Bob asked worriedly, looking at the foreman's swollen face. Yes, I haven't slept all night, he admitted. You know how lonely it is at that age. The man sighed. Sometimes you feel so much pressure that you don't want to live. Martin, you're still so young. You should get married. The assistant said to him seriously, What's your age? You're not seventy years old. Although even at that age some people manage to have affairs. Body, where am I going to find a normal woman at this age? He asked with annoyance in his voice. Nobody wants a choleric guy like me. Come on, laughed the boy. My uncle got married for the fifth time when he was sixty-five years old. Wow, laughed the foreman. Didn't he get a medal for that? That's how much nerve you have to have for five wives. I certainly would not have endured so many of them. As he says, I've been happy with every one of them, Bobby replied. That's why, at seventy-five, he's blooming. Bobby, I've been wishing that we could get through the day and finally go away for the weekend. Martin smiled. Dreaming of a new wife is too much for me. By four o'clock they had finished the remaining seven billets. They could go home early today. It was an unspoken rule between him and the director. Nicholas, the chief approached the men. That's it. So let's look at engineering from Monday. Because I'm already tired of this machine. Aha, uh -huh, agreed the one. We need to finish the project there. You look at the drawings then. That's my job. Martin sighed. I'm both a reaper and a tinkerer. Martin, what can I do? Nicholas looked at him tiredly. If we had different volumes, I could take more people, and we're struggling from bread to porridge. Yes, I understand everything, answered the engineer. I have no complaints against you. To ruin such a plant, try to build it again. It will cost billions. D, sighed the chief. How hard and time-consuming to build, but so quick and easy to break. This evening Martin opened another can that Bobby's mom had handed him. He enjoyed crunching on the delicious pickled vegetables, and then homesickness came over him again, and he couldn't sleep for a very long time. Well, all right. Tomorrow's a day off anyway. I'll sleep until lunchtime, the man said as he saw the hand of the clock stand still at three. Outside the window it was raining in October, and Martin had slept until lunchtime. He struggled to open his eyes. The man was still in bed for a while. The heating hadn't been turned on yet, and the apartment was cold. Who invented this stupid rule that the heating should be turned on when the average daily temperature does not exceed 8 degrees Celsius for five days? Martin resented, 
and the fact that it's so cold in the apartment that you don't even have to take off your coat, doesn't anyone care? Especially here. These Dan Stavropol winds. How could you build a city in such an inconvenient place? He bemoaned. And it was true. Even though Southwold was in the south, it was always being blown around by the winds. There were times when even in the summer a strong cold wind blew. The packages lying in the garbage cans here soared up to the top floors of the fourteen-story buildings. Finally, Martin crawled out of his bed and, covering himself with a blanket, went to the kitchen. Five minutes later his body was already warmed by hot tea. How can I go outside? He watched in shock as the rain poured down and the wind bent the trees to the ground. You can't take an umbrella with you. The wind would break it right away. For half an hour, the man tried to review his closet to find something to wear. The refrigerator was empty, except for the raspberry jam Bob's mother had given him and half a quart of cabbage. Well, God be with you, Martin said to himself, and then he put on his raincoat and went outside. He walked stubbornly against the wind to get to the nearest door. The rain whipped right into his face, and I've still got you fooled, the man thought, looking at the tall rubber boots. You sure can't get my feet wet. Finally, he opened the door to the store and pulled out his large bag. Then he reached into his pocket and pulled out a list. So, what do we have here? He looked down the list. Potatoes, carrots, beets, butter, soup set, kefir, two yogurts, Martin Reed. In general, you cannot even read and just take from the shelves everything I see. He sighed. The man spent about an hour in the store. His basket was completely filled. I haven't forgotten anything, he asked himself. Yeah, I don't think so. I didn't take anything extra either. Backwards the wind was harder to overpower the man. But despite the heaviness, the bags were flapping back and forth in the breeze. What a foul climate is this. Martin scolded, still called south. It was never this cold in Shields. Although Sverdlovsk had long ago been renamed Catterchester, the man had never called it that. It was always Shields to him. Martin returned home. He realized that in such weather one should save oneself either with hot tea or hot soup, or rather borscht. That's a different matter. He blew on his spoon, where the hot borscht was smoking. Now I'm sure I won't get cold. The day was so gray and dull that he didn't want to do anything. Sometimes on weekends he read a magazine, but today the man was in no mood at all. He lay down on his old couch and fell asleep almost instantly. Young Martin paced nervously on the platform. It was hot outside, the train had finally pulled up, and the boy boarded it. There were a few minutes left before the train departed, when suddenly a familiar face appeared on the platform. Martin, cried the girl, Martin. She was running from one carriage to another. Suddenly she saw his face in the window and ran to the carriage door. But the conductor had already raised the steps, and the train moved quietly. Martin. The girl ran back to the window where she saw the boy. I love you. She ran after the carriage. Don't go away. The girl ran to the end of the platform and stopped. She shouted something for a long time. Martin saw her tears. Her voice pierced his whole body, and he woke up sharply. Why do I dream of her? He shouted in anger. When will you leave me alone? Martin threw his pillow on the floor with anger. He sat down unhappily on the sofa. He didn't like to remember what had happened to him. But about ten years ago, he started to be haunted by the same dream. Martin always felt bad after it. In order to shift his attention, he walked over to the sideboard and picked up his wife's picture. I did the right thing then, he said loudly. So let everything leave me alone. After a few minutes he began to feel better. The man got up and went to the kitchen to put the kettle on. The latter gave him a chance to warm up. And you can't go out in this weather, he said sadly. I could go shopping, but I don't want to go out in this wind and rain. Martin turned on the TV, flicked through the channels, found a movie. I'm not going to have a detective in me right now. He sighed and changed the channel to a movie about becoming a father. 
Well, let's see, he smiled. Even though I don't need it, I'll look at little kids. Maybe I'll be in a better mood. They're all so cute. The man listened with interest as the young dads talked about the difficulties of their early days of parenthood. Some couldn't sleep at night. Some were afraid to approach their child for a while. There were some who developed depression and even avoided their newborn babies. I wonder, what kind of dad would I be? Martin thought. Would I be able to hold a newborn so easily in my arms? And how would I feel about it? Over the handoff, the man didn't notice how quickly the time flew by. He savored the feelings that the babies evoked in his heart. Oh, what a pretty little butthole. He laughed as he looked at the three-month-old boy on the screen. There is already trying to hold his head. I wish I had the kind of courage these kids have. It seems like they're not afraid of anything in life. They're interested in trying everything. That little girl is looking at the rattle with such interest. You can see that she's studying it. The program ended and Martin's mood lifted. The sight of little children seemed to breathe life into him. The man smiled all evening. Yes, how I'd like to support such a toddler in my arms just once. He said dreamily. That evening he went to bed early, and to his great surprise he fell asleep without any trouble. What a miracle! Martin looked out of the window. Yesterday it was deep fall, and today it is spring. Since morning, the sun was shining outside, and it was very warm for October. It's not like Indian summer has begun, or it's a continuation of it. The man wondered. Today we should definitely go for a walk. Because now we don't know when the weather will be so nice. Martin got dressed and went out onto the balcony. He could hear birds singing in the trees. The man pressed the elevator button and went outside. Where should I go? He stopped on the street in bewilderment. To Victory Park. I don't want to go. There are all those nightmare merry-go-rounds and horrible sounds there. There you have to go so far away from the central alley not to hear all that. Why don't we go to Chellin's or Tom's Woods? There'll be a lot of people there tonight, so I won't get lost. Probably Tomaski, he decided. Because of the good weather, there were a lot of people walking around the park. There were parents with their children, who ran merrily along the paths and constantly asked their moms and dads questions. Brithing was easy and good, colorful leaves were falling from above, and there was no beginning or end to this waltz. Martin saw a tree lying on the ground and sat down on it. The man closed his eyes with pleasure. It is so nice here, he whispered. The air is so fresh after the rain. The main paths were paved. Therefore, it was safe to walk here without fear of mud. Martin still wanted to walk around the park for a while, but he was so hungry that he couldn't bear the feeling of hunger anymore. The man walked out of the woods and headed towards the bus stop. Today was a wonderful day, he smiled. A walk like this is only good for me. It chased away all my moping. Finally, the man got off at the bus stop and headed toward his house. He stroked his stomach in anticipation. Martin quickly hopped into the elevator and eagerly opened the door to his apartment. He quickly undressed and put the borscht on the stove. He lightly sliced the sausage and sat down at the table. No sooner had he taken the spoon in his hand than the doorbell rang. Damn it. Martin cursed. Who else has come in there? He got up unhappily from the table and headed for the door. The man looked through the peephole in amazement. Some women in black clothes were standing in the hallway. Oh my God, who is that? He thought in shock. Martin decided not to open the door, but the strangers were not satisfied with this decision. The women continued to press the bell. Who is it? Martin couldn't stand it. What do you want? We need Stone Martin, came a woman's voice. We're from the convent. What convent? The man marveled. You must have me confused with someone else. I have nothing to do with religion. From Street John of Mary Convent came the same voice. I'm Mother Superior. Please open up. We have very important business with you. Martin hesitated for a while and opened the door. The man looked at the uninvited guests with a displeased look. What business do you have with me? He said coldly. I'm sorry, but I can't tell you everything in a minute. 
said the nun with kindness in her voice. You see, a few days ago, a young woman came to our monastery for a tour. She looked to be about thirty years old. She asked to meet me and talk to me. We talked about her personal life. The woman asked me to give her advice on what she should do. She called herself Valley, but I don't think that was her real name. She came to our convent a few times. But when we made our rounds this morning, we found this. She pointed to a basket. It was quite large. What is it? The man asked with interest. What does it have to do with me? Well, as far as I'm concerned, it has everything to do with me. The mother superior sighed and took the basket from her novice's hands. The woman opened the coverlet, and Martin immediately turned pale. In it two little girls were sleeping sweetly. They were boys, judging from their blue suits. Whose children are they? And what have they to do with me? Here, read this, the nun held out the note. We found this in the basket with the children. I'm sorry, but I can't keep these children after all. When you find them, I'll be far away. I'm leaving Russia forever. I beg you very much. Find my father Stone Martin and give him my children. Read the landlord. This is some kind of mistake. The man shouted. I don't have any children. My wife and I have never been able to have a child, and I've never had anyone but her. Okay, we can do a DNA test, and then you can decide what you want to do with the babies. The mother superior looked at him sternly. I'm not going to do anything. Martin said indignantly. I can see that someone is trying to set me up. I don't know if you have anything to do with these children, the nun continued. But what I do know is that you'll have to deal with the police, and they'll drag you in any case until a genetic test for your parentage is done. The woman kept her voice steady. So it's up to you. Ava, you deal with us or you deal with the police. But if they're not my grandchildren, what then? The man tried to dodge. He'll apologize to me for getting on my nerves. I serve God, she replied calmly. And for him, the most innocent are defenseless children. I have nothing to apologize for. All right. Martin gave up. But what am I going to do with them now? The children will stay with us until you take a DNA test. The mother superior smiled. Besides, there's always the possibility that their mother will change her mind and take them away. Okay, I'll take the afternoon off tomorrow and find out how to do the test, the man said grudgingly, and looked at the women questioningly. Is there anything else? No, the guest replied. Thank you. We will wait for you tomorrow. Please try to make it as soon as possible. We can't keep the boys here for long either. It's illegal. Martin closed his door. He lost his appetite and lay down on the sofa exhausted. This day had started out so well, and they had to spoil it so badly. He resented him. I had no one at all but Molly, and it was clear that someone had decided to make a fool of me. Somebody just wanted to set me up. But that's all right. I'll show you. You think it's that easy to pin all this on me. I'm sure your test won't show any parentage. The next day, Martin got up in a terrible mood. Not only did he have a headache, but he also had to ask Nikolai Vladimirovich for time off. Today they were going to look at old and new projects, but the chief had allowed him to do his business until lunch without saying anything. I still have to spend so much money on this nonsense. Martin said in shock when they told him the price for the test. I have nothing else to do. Who's going to reimburse me for all this? But despite his inner protests, he asked the nurse to come to the monastery and take the test for him and the babies. The man furtively looked at the babies. He was drawn to them by some invisible force. Martin quickly restrained himself and left the monastery room. The test will be ready in five days, said the nurse. You will receive a notification on your phone. Five days. Terrified. The man interrogated. Is that how long you have to wait? Unfortunately, it can't be any faster, she explained. We have to wait a certain amount of time for the reagents to detect the right genes. Martin returned to work sullenly. Nothing pleased him. He had hoped that the next day he would know the result and forget about this case once and for all. But now it turned out that he would have to suffer for five whole days. 
Who could have suggested this idea to this girl? Thought the engineer. How did she even find my name? Maybe one of my former colleagues played a joke on me like this, and now I have to deal with all this. The man sat there thinking about his own thoughts while the director explained something to him. Well, do you agree? Nicholas asked him. Shall we do it that way? What? Martin came back to reality. I'm sorry. I didn't hear what you said. Martin, what is it? Is something wrong? The chief asked him worriedly. Don't even think about being sick. We've got a big order for parts coming in. No, it's just me. I was up all night with a headache, he replied. Let's go over what you told me again. After work for the first time in a long time, Martin did not want to go home. He had a feeling that something bad was waiting for him there, or rather, some kind of surprise was waiting for him there. What could be worse than what has already happened, he pondered. Only if it all turns out to be true, the thought flew into his head. The man stopped abruptly. It was as if he was stunned. Martin realized that such a thing was simply impossible, but something inside insisted that by some miracle it had happened after all. By the time I wait for this result, I'll just go crazy, the man said aloud, and walked toward the bus stop. The bus was running as it always did, but it seemed to the man that on this day the twenty was just flying. He looked at his watch, but the bus was on schedule. Oh, how I don't want to go home, he paused. I'll go for a walk somewhere. Martin turned around and walked in the opposite direction from his house. The weather was nothing today either, certainly not as warm as yesterday, but still. It was already getting dark and passers-by were bustling in the street. A man stopped near some public garden and stood there for a long time. It was as if he had fallen somewhere. He was not interested in the dog that ran up to him and started barking at him, not in the loving couple sitting on the bench, not in the loud music of teenagers. It was as if everything had stopped. But the man felt such a warmth on his heart that he was even afraid to move. Martin was afraid that if he took even one step, this likeness would immediately disappear. My God, what's happening to me? He finally came to his senses. What am I doing here? Oh my God, the time is already eight. I have to go home. He quickly scampered towards his house, had a light supper because he had lost his appetite. Sweet tea with the scone satisfied his hunger enough and went to bed. Some strange things are happening to me. The thought occurred to him. What it all means, he thought, and with this question he fell asleep. Three days passed, and the man even somehow calmed down. He didn't think about the test anymore. He had the confidence that everything would be fine. So I had nothing to do with it at all. He rejoiced at his intuition. Tomorrow, at last, I'll take the test and live my life again. Martin asked to leave work an hour early so that he could pick up the test at the lab. The man reluctantly changed his clothes and gathered his belongings. He said goodbye to Bobby and walked out of the gatehouse. Outside, it was drizzling rain. Surprisingly, there was no wind. Martin opened his umbrella and walked to the bus stop. He didn't have to wait long. In five minutes, he was already sitting in the bus. Well, now I will quickly pick up everything and immediately go home, the man dreamed. Tomorrow I'll tell the nuns not to bother me anymore, he smiled. As luck would have it, the minibus was going very slowly. Martin fidgeted unhappily in his seat. It's as if the disabled are driving, the passenger said angrily to himself. And who employs such drivers? Another twenty minutes passed when the driver told Martin that he was getting off at the next stop. The man thanked him just in case. He paid and quickly got off the shuttle bus. So... Where do I go next? He reasoned. They told me at the beginning of the street. Then I'd better turn here. Martin got lost and lost about thirty minutes. The man cursed out loud at himself and finally asked passers-by for the right direction. After about three hundred meters, the starting numbers showed up. So it must be around here somewhere, he rejoiced. So it must be around here somewhere, he rejoiced and hurried to the beginning of the street. Martin ran into the lab and gave his name. Five minutes later, he was handed the result in an envelope. He opened it immediately, 96 percent. 
Martin read it aloud and turned pale. Then he came to his senses and approached the man at the counter. Tell me, please, does 96% in the test mean that I have no kinship? He asked excitedly. On the contrary, the girl smiled. 96 is a very high probability that you are related. You could say it is. Rebecca, can you hear me? The voice persisted for several minutes. Rebecca. Finally, the girl opened her eyes and looked around at everyone present with an incomprehensible look. She realized from the white coats of the man and woman that she was probably in a hospital. Where am I? Rebecca barely spoke. What happened to me? Angie, Angie, you fell from the scaffolding. The doctor answered her. Your daughter is still with your mother. The girl closed her eyes with fatigue and was pulled down again. From somewhere at the beginning of the tunnel, she could faintly hear sounds. Rebecca came to her senses again after a few days. This time she was able to stay conscious. She felt how much her back hurt and her right leg was twisted. The latter was in a cast. You're here for a long time, the nurse sighed. So you'd better stop fussing. We called your mother and the doctor said you could see her. My daughter Angie, the victim said. Ask her to bring my daughter. Two days later, Rebecca's mother, Gwyneth, came. Her daughter didn't notice anything new about her. It didn't bother her that Rebecca had miraculously survived or that she had a calm granddaughter. How long are you going to stay here? Her mother said in a haughty voice instead of greeting. I wasn't hired to babysit Angie. You can see that, she said calmly. So you'll have to be patient. I have no other relatives here besides you. It's not enough that you don't know from whom you gave birth to her. Now you want to hang her on me. The woman was angry. Don't even think about it. Come on, get up quickly. I'm not going to mess with her. Rebecca remained silent and asked her daughter to come closer. A girl about five years old cried and came to her mom. Mommy, the child sobbed. Take me away. I don't want to live with my grandmother. She doesn't love me. And it was true. Gwyneth not only did not love her granddaughter, but she never loved her daughter. The woman had spent her whole life thinking she was something special. Rebecca's father she couldn't live with. Or rather, he could not stand her arrogant character and ran away from her. With his daughter, he never communicated, for the reason that it was necessary to organize all this through her mother. Gwyneth from early childhood reproached her daughter for the fact that she was born into the world at all for how much effort she spent on her. When the girl was twelve, she saw very clearly that love from her mother, she did not need to wait. From that time on, the girl, you could say, lived her own life. Rebecca studied well at school, entered the institute and graduated. The girl, as soon as she began to work part-time in the evening, immediately rented a room and moved out from her mother. She was not only not against it, but frankly abused her daughter with the last words for the fact that it did not happen earlier. In general, Rebecca had never had a good relationship with her mother, no matter how much she wished she had. Gwyneth had thwarted all her attempts. Oil was added to the fire by the fact that the girl became pregnant and gave birth to the child herself. No one knew who was the father of Angie, but from that moment Rebecca's mother was so furious with her that they completely stopped talking. Naturally, no help or support she gave her daughter. The girl worked to the last, even when she could barely walk with a big belly. Rebecca had a good friend. Thank God, at least she was lucky in this, who helped her all this time. After Angie was born, Rebecca ran part-time jobs with a small child. She didn't have her own place, and sometimes her friend Victoria babysat the baby. When Angie was one and a half years old, Rebecca gave her to a kindergarten. The girl herself got a job at a construction site. She was not afraid of heights and easily plastered and decorated the facades of buildings. In three years, Rebecca collected enough money to buy a small house in the suburbs. That's where she and Angie lived all this time. Rebecca herself did not realize how she had fallen from the scaffolding. The girl usually always had insurance. She only remembered her foot stumbling and the board bouncing off to the side. Then Rebecca saw herself flying and felt a strong blow 
after which she lost consciousness. As the doctor said, she was lucky because it was only the third floor. After Rebecca was brought to the hospital, the question of Angie came up. Victoria, the girl's friend was not given the girl at that time. They'd brought the child to her mother. This subsequently played a very big negative role in Rebecca's life. The girl was in the hospital for almost five months. Then she was sent to a sanatorium for another six months for rehabilitation. All this time Angie was at her mother's house, and finally, when the girl was discharged and she took her daughter, Rebecca was in complete shock. I'm not going to eat that, six-year-old Angie said with her arms crossed over her chest. And I want to go to Grandma Nadia's. I'm going to live with her from now on. What happened to my child? The woman looked at her daughter in shock. Angie, I'm your mother, so you'll live with me. What kind of mother are you? The girl said angrily. Do you even know from whom you gave birth to me? Grandmother Gwyneth had a husband, and you, Rebecca, turned pale. She looked at her child and couldn't recognize him. Almost a year, her mother had made Angie a real monster, the kind of monster she herself had been. Angie, you tell the teacher that you don't want to live with her. Her grandmother taught her when she sneaked into the kindergarten. Say that she beat you, does not buy you anything, then you will definitely live with me. That's what you want, isn't it? Well, of course yes. Hug the girl, Gwinnett. You are the only one I love. I don't want her. From that moment on in Rebecca's life, there was one problem after another. Angie at daycare was always telling stories that her mother was treating her badly. The girl would sometimes sob for hours to get attention. The social welfare authorities kept calling Rebecca in. Try to take her to a psychologist. One of them advised the woman. I realize you're not doing all this with her. But there's a reason why she's making all this up. A psychologist will be able to explain it to you. Rebecca did her best, but she had a lot of health problems after the fall. Her right leg was numb all the time. She limped and couldn't walk fast enough. She could no longer get a good job. Her leg was in severe pain down to her abdomen, and she could hardly hold back her tears. Victoria, I'm going to go crazy, Rebecca once told her friend. What am I going to do? She burst into tears. Angie doesn't recognize me at all. She doesn't even call me by my first name. She doesn't even say mom to me. How could my mother do this to me? I mean, she did it to me. Gwyneth was very pleased with herself. She'd finally gotten revenge on her daughter for everything. For taking up her time. For the pain of labor. For the expenses she'd incurred. And most of all for giving birth to Rebecca by some guy named Angie. Well, now we'll see. She cheered. You won't have a daughter anymore. Angie will belong to me. The woman looked lovingly at her sleeping daughter. The girl was sleeping sweetly. Oh my God, how can such a creature live in such an angel? She thought, wiping away her tears. Angie, how much I love you. Why do you do this to me? But then the girl woke up, and everything happened again. She spoke to her mother in a commanding tone, blackmailed her into running away to her grandmother. Victoria, I can't take it anymore. Rebecca came to visit a friend one day. I can't take it anymore. It's not enough that I can't work for a long time, my lower back, and my leg hurt. So now, apparently, on nervous ground, my right leg is constantly falling off. Sometimes it just stops moving. I'm afraid I'm going to stop walking soon. Revy, Victoria said gently, maybe you should talk to him. If you want, I'll tell John, he'll find his information. Victoria, he left me without Angie, she sighed. What am I going to tell him about her? I'm sorry that the one night we were together, I got pregnant. If he wanted to, he would have found me long ago. I'm not going to find him, she said coldly. Rebecca came in from a friend's house, her leg aching again. She lay down on the couch and closed her eyes. Scenes from her past life came before her. There was noise and commotion in the auditorium. The first year class was very hectic. There were only five girls for the entire group of twenty boys. All the students were looking at each other curiously. No one knew anyone yet. 
Rebecca sat alone at the last table. She was looking out the window and not participating in all the introductions. Suddenly some guy sat down in front of her. He put down his bag, but then turned sharply to the girl and asked her something. She answered him briefly. It seemed to Yuliana that the guy was not from around here. That's how her first acquaintance with him happened. After a few months, Rebecca realized that she liked the guy. It was almost five years later when a romantic relationship began between them. Or rather, it didn't happen until May when they were writing their diploma. Fortunately or not, they were assigned to write their diploma together. Rebbe, the guy came up to her one day. Look, I brought the blueprints. We've got to do this last calculation for the diploma. Martin, everything seems to be good here. The girl looked at the scheme. You're doing a great job. She patted him on the shoulder. Such a scrupulous job you've done. Rebbe, let's go to a cafe, suggested the student. I haven't been away from my desk for almost a week, so let's take our minds off it. The girl was very embarrassed, despite the fact that she liked Martin very much. He usually kept coldly with her. Before she could answer him, the guy had already put all the blueprints in a tube and was waiting for her near the door. Well, are you coming? He urged the girl on. Let's hurry up, I tell you honestly, I'm so hungry. The young people went to the student cafe. There they sat for about two hours, discussing their diploma and its defense. I think that you should present the theoretical part, and then I will present the drawings and calculations, Martin suggested. Okay, Rebecca agreed. I'm all for it. If you knew how much I don't like calculations, she laughed. Rebecca, this will be our future work. Martin laughed and looked at her intently, but then he stopped and blushed. They sat in the cafe for a long time, somehow imperceptibly went home in one direction. Whether Martin saw the girl off that day or not, it is hard to say. But the young people stopped near the house where Rebecca rented a room. Will you stay here? The girl asked him curiously. Or will you go home? At first I really wanted to go, but now I don't know. Martin said with annoyance in his voice, I promised my father that I would come back. What if you have a job here? Family. The girl looked him in the eyes. Well, it's all very complicated for me, Rebbe, he sighed. I've tied myself to the house without realizing it. I gave my word, and I can't break it. Even if your fate depends on it, she smiled. Even then you'll come back. I don't know, the boy replied tiredly. Sometimes I feel like I'm not living my life. It's like I'm not in my life. My mother and father and other people are there. They want me to do what's best for them. But sooner or later it will all come out, the girl replied. One day it will make you feel so unhappy. You may be right, Martin looked at her. I like you very much, Rebecca, he said suddenly, but I cannot. The boy turned abruptly and walked quickly away. The girl could not understand what to do, whether to run after him now or to leave everything as it is. From that day on, Martin began to avoid Rebecca. They met only formally to discuss the diploma. The girl felt that he cared about her, and it only hurt her more. Time flew by quickly. The day of the diploma defense came. Martin and Rebecca defended their diplomas on excellent. The guy couldn't stand it and approached her. Rebecca, let's celebrate our defense, he suggested her. Let me buy you a last drink. Do you drink champagne? Martin, I'm a champagne drinker, she laughed. I've only had champagne a few times in my life. All right, let's have some champagne, Martin suggested. You and I will go to the restaurant, Velmoja. To be honest, I've never been there, but we should try it sometime. The guys had a good meal and were on their way home late at night. Eliana's champagne hit her head so hard that she couldn't keep on her feet. Oh my God, one glass made me so sick. She scolded when Martin took her under his arm. It's all right. I'll help you, the boy replied thoughtfully. Rebbe, don't worry. Everything will be fine. In about fifteen minutes they were outside Rebecca's house. The girl tried to climb the steps, but almost fell down. Oh, shit, she cursed. I've never had a drink, and after this time, 
I'm not going to have one. What floor are we on? She heard Martin's voice. Let me take you up. They went up to the third floor, and Rebecca opened the door, but unfortunately she fell when she took off her sandals. The boy picked her up in his arms and carried her into the room. Carefully he laid the girl on the bed. Martin, when you leave, please close the door, Rebecca asked him. My landlady is in the hospital, and I'm living alone for now. I'll get up later and lock the door. The boy looked intently at the girl. He unconsciously reached out his hand and stroked her hair. Then he began to kiss her. The young people themselves did not notice how something very important happened between them. Martin looked at Rebecca. The girl was sound asleep. He quietly dressed and left her apartment. Lord, what have I done? He lamented. But don't I love her? Argued two voices in his head. I know for a fact that I love Rebecca. I feel it. But what about Molly, father? His brain was exploding. What am I going to tell them? I'll tell them so. I've met my fate. The next day, Martin tried to talk to his father, but the man flatly refused to listen to him. Choose, Martin, either us or Shields, Alex said at the end of the conversation. Martin realized that Rebecca was waiting for him, and he had to go to her. The guy was facing a very difficult choice. His father called him again and started threatening him. Martin gathered his things, said goodbye to his aunt, and went to the train station. Rebecca finally found where he lived and rang the doorbell. He left for the station about an hour ago. Aunt Katie answered. He's going home today. The girl rushed as fast as she could to the station. She ran as fast as she could. She got there when the train was already on the platform. It took her five minutes to run around all the cars. She spotted Martin sitting on the side seat, looking out the window. When he saw Rebecca, the guy jumped up and headed for the exit. But just before the doors closed in front of his nose, a girl stood on the platform and shouted something to him. The guy rushed back to his seat. Rebecca ran up to him. She was screaming that she loved him, asking him to stay. But it was as if Martin was paralyzed. All he could do was sit and stare out the window. I'm doing the right thing. It pounded in his head. It's all in the past. I'll never even remember it. Rebecca sat on the platform for hours. She only went home when the tears stopped pouring from her eyes. Many times Rebecca wanted to find Martin and tell him that she was pregnant, but inside the girl felt that their meeting would cause her unbearable pain. It's not a question of Martin not loving me, she thought afterward. He couldn't come to his house with me, which means that either his parents didn't want me or they've already found someone at home for him. So be it, Rebecca decided then. She came to her senses and gingerly stood up from her couch. She was overcome with such longing that she even found it hard to breathe. First my life was taken from me by Martin. She sighed, and now it's taking my daughter from me too. And to her great regret, it turned out to be true. No matter how hard Rebecca tried in the following years to save Angie, she never succeeded. Her life was forever ruined by her own mother. Where are you going? Rebecca asked her daughter in amazement as she packed her things. I'm going to my grandmother's, 16-year-old Angie calmly replied. I won't live with you anymore. Angie, you're not 18 yet, her mother tried to reason with her. I won't let you. And who are you? The girl asked with her hands at her sides. What have you done for me? The woman looked at her daughter in shock. She smirked at her daughter. The girl did everything to make her mother feel pain from her words. All right, Rebecca said suddenly to herself. Let your grandmother do everything for you now. From this day forward, I will not interfere in your life. Angie left, and the woman sobbed for a long time. She couldn't get over it. But just as Rebecca expected, a few days later, her mother called. Do you have any conscience at all? She said at once. I need money to support Angie. Didn't you think of that when you turned my daughter against me? The woman replied calmly, Now you're on your own. I will never give you or Angie a dime. And the woman disconnected the phone and didn't hear her mother's last words for a long time. Rebecca was in a lot of pain, 
but she had given herself her word that she had left her daughter for good. However, Angie came to her several times and with scandals tried to get money out of her mother, but all was unsuccessful. That's how Rebecca was left alone. Over time, she calmed down, her leg began to hurt less. The woman was able to get a half-day job, and after many years she was given disability. Many years passed, and Rebecca knew nothing about her daughter. There were rumors that she was going to marry a local oligarch. Angie, Gwynette taught her granddaughter, Your job is to lure a wealthy man into the net. You have a beautiful figure not to mention your face, so don't even think about getting involved with a simpleton, or you'll end up just like your mother together. They devised a plan, identified the most eligible suitors in Catterchester, and began to act. Gwyneth pretended to be an intellectual. She wore a hat with a veil, pretended to have taste. Unfortunately, it looked ridiculous from the outside, but the woman was so sure of herself, so they chose Sterling Aaron as their victim. Gwyneth didn't mind that the guy was a real ladies' man. The main thing is to get him in your net, she taught her granddaughter, and then he will forget about all his women and will belong only to you. Whether the woman believed what she said, it was hard to say. From the outside, it looked more like she was just playing Angie. She liked to control the girl, and she never fully realized that all her life she had been fulfilling the whims of an inadequate man. Grandma, he asked me out on a date. Angie came running home one day. I think I've got Aaron on the hook now. The main thing is to show him that you have dignity. Gwyneth was pleased with the news. Take it one step at a time. Never take the high road in these situations. Luck turned in their direction, and Sterling officially explained that his girlfriend was Angie. The girl tried her best not to slap her face in the dirt. Her efforts were not in vain, and Aaron set a wedding day. At last, now we'll have a life. Gwyneth rejoiced. Angie, I want a big house with servants, the woman dreamed. There must be trips abroad, expensive clothes and food, a grandmother. All this you will have laughed the student. There was not long to wait. The wedding thundered with pomp. Angie and Aaron spent their honeymoon in Bali. The girl was so happy. She now and then called her grandmother and told about how she now lives. But after returning home, everything changed dramatically. First Sterling began to disappear during the day. Then his absence shifted to the evening, and within a year he was no longer at home at night. Aaron, sobbed Angie, don't you love me at all? Are you seeing someone else? Darling, he laughed. Don't sing to me about love. Did you marry me for love? Let me live my life, and I promise I won't touch you. But Angie couldn't. At first, she and her grandmother were afraid of losing such wealth. Her scandals led to the fact that Aaron began to cut her money. The girl did not understand his actions and continued to insist on her own. It eventually ended with Sterling putting divorce papers on the table one day. I think you realize that now you will leave here with nothing. He said sternly, Do not even think of suing me, Angie. I'll just kill you. And the girl went back to her grandmother. Her granddaughter really bought her a house, not as big as she dreamed of, but still. Gwyneth had also hired two maids. Angie, she said in shock when she learned that Sterling had divorced her granddaughter. How are we supposed to live now? Well, we have your house, she said, so we'll figure something out. That was not Gwyneth's plan. And from that moment on, the woman began to evict her granddaughter from her house in all sorts of clever ways. Angie, Angie, he is such a good man. The grandmother advised her granddaughter one man. He does not smoke and does not drink. He has an apartment, so you will have a place to live. He will work and you will sit at home. Grandma, he's old. The girl was indignant. He's 45, and I'm 27. That's all right, Gwyneth insisted. The main thing is that he should provide for you. The pressure continued for several more years, and Angie's grandmother managed to persuade her to marry a respectable man. Well, that's good. She rubbed her hands together. I'm rid of her at last, and she was going to live in my house. She must have forgotten who is the neck and who is the head. 
I'll never do anything to my own detriment. And that's where Angie was out of luck. The man turned out to be a drinker. She put up with it for a few months and went back to her grandmother's house. You know, Angie, I'm sick of you and your problems. She did not let her granddaughter into her house. But where am I going, Grandma? I'm pregnant, I'm four months along, and nobody wants to abort me. Did I sleep with that man? Winneth screamed at the top of her voice. You made this mess. You're gonna have to clean it up yourself. All right, then I'll show the deed to your house to the police, and at least I'll get my share of it. And at most I'll throw you out of here. The woman was frightened by her words and let Angie into the house. From that moment on, she tried to get rid of the girl. Angie, once said her grandmother, who will sit with your children. You're having twins, I can't do it. But your mother is not even worth counting on, so give them straight to the orphanage. How to the orphanage? The girl shuddered. Are you suggesting I give up my children? And who will feed you and them? Gwyneth looked at her sternly. I don't know. The girl answered with annoyance in her voice. But that doesn't mean I have to give them to an orphanage. You know what a disgrace that would be. And you make sure that no one finds out about it, said the woman cunningly. How? Angie was surprised. Everyone here has seen me with a huge belly. Am I telling you about shields? She smiled. There are so many women who find their happiness abroad. I've already found the right one for you. Gwyneth jumped up and brought out a photograph. She showed it to her granddaughter. Here you are, Patrick. She pointed her finger in the stranger's face. He lives on a farm in Italy. He's a wealthy man. He has vineyards and a citrus orchard. How can I go to him myself? The girl wouldn't stop. They won't just let me go to Italy. Well, for this, there is a marriage bureau, said the grandmother moralizing. I've already found out everything. I gave her a picture of you in your twenties. You look very pretty in it. The agent helped me write a letter. He replied three days ago. Well, the job's done. Patrick's waiting for you. Angie couldn't get over it. Of course, she had heard that it was possible now, but not knowing a man at all. How it was possible to marry him, the girl could not imagine. And don't forget, Gwyneth said sternly, you have no children, or you'll spoil everything. He only agreed to marry you because you have no children. He wants you to have children of your own. So I'll have to leave my sons in Russia, the girl said in shock. But I can't. You can, the woman ordered. Otherwise you will stay on the street together with them. I won't feed you anymore. Angie could not recover from her conversation with Gwyneth for a long time. She was tormented by vague doubts. But on the other hand, the girl realized that she had nowhere to go with these children. She had never worked. She had no money. Maybe I should leave them to their mother, she pondered. But she herself can barely walk. She'll give them to the orphanage later, or they'll take them away from her. Someone said she'd been given a disability. No, that's not an option. Angie couldn't decide what to do with her children for several days. The girl was already doing the paperwork for Italy. What if, flash through her head. That's right. Leave them to their father. The mother said his name was Martin. No, there's no way to leave the kids to him directly. We'll have to do something clever. I'll find out where he lives first, and then I'll figure something out. One of the old acquaintances, Angie, worked for the police. He found her information about her father. Southwold then, the girl pondered. Right, I'm going into labor next week. Afterward, I'll pick up the kids and drag over there. Maybe I should leave them outside the church with a note. I'll see what they have there. Oh my. So many cathedrals and churches. Is there even a convent? That's right. A convent. Angie shouted with joy. I'll leave the children there. When Angie boarded the plane, her visa to Italy was ready. The girl flew to Stavropol in anticipation. But as soon as she arrived at the monastery, there was such a heaviness in her heart that Angie began to doubt her plans. Lord, how will I leave them to a complete stranger? She sobbed, looking at the little ones. Maybe he is an alki or some lying invalid. The girl stayed in the hotel for several days. 
She still did not dare to leave the children. Several times she talked to the mother superior. Of course she did not tell what had really happened. I have a few days left, Angie reasoned. I need to make up my mind about something eventually. Angie, don't even think about it. Grandma shouted into the phone. Over my dead body only. If you leave them behind, not only will I not recognize them, but I'll disown you too. Don't ever count on me again. Even if you become a bum, I'll pass you by and never throw you a ruble. God, I can't understand anything. Martin wailed, clutching his head. I've never had anyone but Molly, have I? How is this even possible? He looked at the test results for the umpteenth time. The man could not come to his senses all evening. He had tried to find some reasonable explanation for it, but he had failed. It was almost three in the morning when he finally went to bed. That night he dreamt of the train again. Martin, I love you, don't go. It was ringing in his ears when the man woke up. Martin sat up abruptly on the bed. It was half past six on the clock. The man stared at one point on the floor and sat like that for a long time. It can't be. It dawned on him. Rebecca, could one time have gotten her pregnant? Christ, there's no one else besides her, is there? I've never been with anyone else at all. Martin stood up quickly and paced around the room. His thoughts went where he had forbidden them to go for so many years. It turns out that Rebecca had a daughter by me, he said aloud. But then why didn't our daughter leave the children to her? Maybe. A heavy thought tore at his heart. No, not that. Rebby, is she really dead? He covered his face with his hands and sobbed. I've been running for my happiness for so many years, and yet she was waiting for me. I've always felt it. Then Rebecca is dead. The thought so struck Martin that he could not get out of bed that afternoon. Well, there's nothing for me to live for now, he said to himself. If Revy is gone, I am no longer needed here. He lay like that until evening. Suddenly his phone rang. It was Mother Superior. Did you get the test results? She asked. We need to deal with the issue of the children urgently. Yes, the man replied briefly. They are really my grandchildren, he said in a low voice. It's an old story from the days of the Institute. What have you decided? The nun continued the conversation. Will you keep the boys? Me? I don't know. Martin was confused. Can I think about it for a while, please? Well, all right. You have until tomorrow, agreed the woman. I'm sorry, but we can't wait any longer. The children have been illegally staying with us for a whole week. Martin came to his senses. There was some strength in him. The man made himself some hot tea and began to think hard like this. I can hire a nanny, so if they don't sleep well at night, I'll at least try to get some sleep during the day, he reasoned. I'll ask someone from the guardianship authorities to teach me how to bathe them and make them porridge. I will go for walks with them myself. There will be no problems here. Since I won't be able to work now, the state should give me some allowance for my children. So I will have some money. The more Martin thought about keeping the children, the more joy appeared in his heart. It's settled, the man finally said and looked at his watch. The big hand was showing twelve. The boys will stay with me. Tomorrow after the convent I'll go straight to work and write a statement. I have so much more paperwork to collect now. The main thing is that I have my own place and I have three hundred thousand on my account. I hope they will agree to give me the children. It was 9 a.m. when Martin spoke to Mother Superior. I think my daughter's mother is dead, he said with annoyance in his voice. Otherwise she would have left them to her. Martin, don't jump to conclusions. The woman looked at him lovingly. I can see that you cared for this woman. Yes, he wept. She was the only person I ever loved. I'm sorry. I can't contain my emotions. That's why I'm telling you not to jump to conclusions, she advised the guest. Contact the police. They will give you that information. Martin lovingly took the children in his arms. The boys were not afraid of him. After he agreed, the mother superior summoned people from the guardianship authorities to the convent. So that same day, they started putting the kids in Stone's name. 
Martin, you're crazy, the headmaster said in shock. Are you serious? You're the father of two little kids. Well, not a father, but a grandfather, Martin corrected Nicholas. And you think it's so easy to give such little ones to an orphanage. And besides, now I see that my life was not in vain. In fact, it turned out to be much more complicated than the man thought. But he did not give up. The boys woke up at night, one or the other, crying all the time. Martin learned to sleep everywhere and under any circumstances. He managed to pocket even in the intervals when he dipped his spoon into the soup. Thankfully, the child welfare authorities provided a free babysitter for the first time. Diapers, formula, milk, porridge. That seems to be everything in that department. Martin checked his list again. On his way home, the man also stopped at a drugstore. He picked up some baby hygiene products. The man was so absorbed in his worries that he even forgot that he had made a request to the police. Stone Martin came an unfamiliar voice. It's about your request for Rebecca Linnis. The woman is alive and living in Catterchester. Will you come to the police station, or shall I give you her address? His heart was racing. He hadn't even expected this good news. Martin quickly wrote down the address on a piece of paper, thanked the policeman, and hung up. So Revy is alive. He rejoiced, and then he was struck with horror. What if she's married? Maybe she gave her daughter to an orphanage. Maybe she never thought of me at all. And once again, Martin was moping. The man didn't know what to do. There was only one reasonable solution, to go to Catterchester and meet Rebecca. But he was insanely afraid of that. What am I going to say to her? He thought. Yulia, forgive me. I am the very last creature. I didn't tell you then that I already had a fiancé. She won't even listen to me. She'll just close the door in my face. Martin went crazy for a few days. The only thing that saved him then was the children. He completely immersed himself in taking care of them, and for a while forgot about Rebecca, or rather about what he should do with her now. Here they are, my dear little ones. He laid his grandson carefully on a towel after bathing. Let's wipe our feet. Let's wipe our hands. Let's not forget our faces. The man lovingly coaxed. The woman looked tiredly out of the window. It was New Year's Eve. Rebecca had already gotten used to her loneliness, but still from time to time the mental wounds made themselves known. God, I'm almost fifty-five, and I've never had a life, she sighed. I'm neither a wife nor a mother, Rebecca sobbed, so no one needs me in my old age. The woman picked up her crutch and went to her chiffonier. She took out some warm clothes. The first snow was already drizzling outside. After about thirty minutes, Rebecca cautiously made her way down to the yard. Despite the white blanket, it was not cold outside. The woman slowly wandered toward a small public garden. Rebecca sat down on a bench and closed her eyes. The cool air burned her nostrils. Baba, Mommy, came the voice of a toddler, and the woman opened her eyes sharply. Standing beside her was a one-and-a-half-year-old child. His mother stood behind him. The baby stomped his little feet and babbled something. Mommy, he turned to the young woman. Baba. He pointed to Rebecca. The woman's soul blossomed. The baby was so funny that she immediately remembered her daughter. She thought it was Angie standing by the bench. Hello, baby, the woman said. Aren't you cold out today? Mommy, he tried to crawl into her arms. Baba, he kept repeating. Let's go home laughed his mother. Your grandmother is sitting at home. You can't take her outside in this weather. Rebecca looked tenderly at the baby his mom, took the boy in her arms, and he waved to her all the way to the stroller. Bye-bye. Rebecca waved to him too. You guys are so funny. At that age, you don't know who's going to grow up. That's why it's so easy. That's how my Angie used to come into my arms and call me mommy. And now I don't even know where she is. And tears flowed from Rebecca's eyes. She felt uncomfortable and got up from the bench and wanted to walk forward a little more, but she wanted to be alone so badly that Rebecca went straight home. She pulled out some old pictures of her daughter 
and couldn't calm down for a long time. Angie, my daughter, she touched the pictures tenderly. How beautiful you look here. I love you so much. This day Rebecca had nothing going for her. First she oversalted her soup, then her jar broke, then there was a knock on her door. Someone had gotten the wrong apartment. What's the matter? The woman scolded. I'm sweating today, so I'm in no mood. And then there's all this. Rebecca decided not to do anything else today. She lay down on the couch and turned on the TV. But thoughts of the past kept her awake that day. Martin's face stood before Rebecca's eyes. I wonder how his fate turned out, she thought. He probably has a family for a long time and is happy. Martin once said he wanted many children, at least two. He definitely has one daughter, and his wife probably has several children. I'd like to see him, he must have changed a lot. And there's not much of the old Rebecca left. She glanced at herself in the mirror. The woman plunged into memories of the Institute. She saw how Martin had written a diploma with her, and then they had defended it so brilliantly. Well done, guys. The manager shook their hands. That's the bar to keep. Only real specialists grow out of such people. Yes, sighed the woman. Everything did not turn out the way I would have liked it. This child has remained a nobody. I hope that at least Martin's life has turned out well. Outside the window, it was still nice, and Rebecca turned off the television. She was getting annoyed with the extraneous noises. She turned off the light and just lay there with her eyes open. She felt light at heart, to her surprise. The tears had washed away some of the sadness and sorrow, and the sun showed behind the dark clouds. No one knows what I'm doing all this for, she thought. Maybe it's all for the best. That's how we complain about fate, and then time passes, and it becomes clear that it was better for everyone. That's how it is for me. I'm holding on to Martin and my daughter, and I should have let them go a long time ago. Perhaps one of them would have come back to me one day. Such simple thoughts struck the woman so much that she thought about it for a long time. Rebecca did not notice how the evening ended and night fell. The woman woke up when it was two o'clock on the clock. Now that's wow. She smiled. I don't remember such a bright state of mind. It's like the sun is burning in the middle of my chest. She rejoiced. How I wish I could fall asleep in this state tonight and feel the same tomorrow morning. There is such clarity in my head and peace inside. Rebecca awoke to the sound of someone ringing her doorbell at length. She jumped up abruptly. It was already ten in the morning. She went to the door and looked through the peephole. There was some man standing in front of the door. Who do you want? Without opening the door, she asked. Who do you want? I'm looking for Rebecca. The woman heard and turned pale. The voice sounded familiar. She also knew that it was very rare that anyone would call her that. There was a click and the door opened. Rebecca eyed the intruder with interest. After a few moments, she caught her breath. Well, hello, Ribby, the man said in a shaky voice. I'm sorry to drop in unannounced. We could talk to you. The woman hesitantly opened the door to the apartment and only now noticed the portable stroller. The guest picked it up and entered. Rebecca couldn't say a word out of shock. Her legs were shaking, and she sat down on a chair. What is it, Martin? She said at last, looking at the cradle. It's a long story. The man tried to smile. We might as well put the children on the bed for now, because they've had a rough flight. A baby cried, followed by a second one. Rebecca pulled the boy out with trembling hands and put him on the couch. Martin took out diapers from a large bag and like a true professional changed them in seconds. We haven't eaten anything since this morning. The man said caringly, we need to make some porridge. Rebecca watched what was happening and could not believe her eyes. She was so amazed that she couldn't even find the words. Martin was in the kitchen. He quickly prepared the baby's food and put the bottles to cool. Then he sat down on a chair and looked intently at the hostess. Rebby, these are our grandchildren, he said calmly. Our daughter gave them to me. What? Rebecca couldn't believe it. Angie, did you have her? No, she left the twins at the convent. 
She put a note in the basket so the monks wouldn't find me. Trying to hold back the tears, he said. Rebbe, I adopted our boys. Finally, the woman couldn't take it anymore and cried loudly. Martinet soothed her. Martin, how can you do this? She said through her tears. How could Angie do such a thing? I don't know. Martin answered briefly. Rebbe, I'm sorry. The man couldn't stand it and cried. I acted like a bastard. I didn't tell you I had a fiancé at home, and I took the opportunity that day. I didn't want to marry Molly. I've always loved only you, but my father forced me to, and I beg you to forgive me. But why didn't you tell me about it then? She sobbed. I've been waiting for you all my life. I forbade myself to think about you for many years. Martin honestly admitted. But after my wife died many years ago, I was afraid that you had a family, and you were happy. Lord, how silly we are. Rebecca got up from her chair and walked over to Martin. We've wasted so many years. No, he hugged her. We're just getting started. Let's go fee our children. The woman took one bottle and put one baby in her arms. The boy gobbled greedily. Rebecca looked at the baby, and with each passing minute her heart filled with love for him. She furtively looked at Martin. The man was so happy, he was just glowing. This is what I had to go through all the trouble for, the woman thought, wiping away her tears with one hand. Nothing happens for nothing. Everything that happens to us has meaning. Martin looked at Juliana with love. He had been so afraid of this meeting, but everything had happened so unexpectedly that he just couldn't believe it all. The man and woman never doubted that it was the best day of their lives. The boys ate and fell fast asleep. Rebecca and Martin went into the kitchen. They had a lot to talk about. They were starting a new phase of their lives, and there were a lot of issues to deal with. Thank you for being able to understand and forgive me, Martin told her that evening. Ma, pa. Voices were heard in the yard. Where are you? Are you in the garden? Eugene. Richard. We're here. The older man waved his hands. By the old cherry tree, the brothers went into the garden, discussing something animatedly on the way. Finally, they saw their parents. Well, can I congratulate you? Asked the mother. How was the defense? Richard and Eugene studied in London. After graduating from school in Catterchester, their teachers advised Martin that his son should go to Moscow State University. Both boys had simply amazing abilities. Richard studied to be a computer programmer, and Eugene, in contrast, became an art historian. But the brothers were not confused by the different directions. They always had something to talk about. After Martin came to Rebecca, they decided to stay in Catterchester. The man didn't mind. He sold his apartment in Southwold, and he and Rebecca were able to buy a large, well-appointed house with a large garden. At first they tried to have the boys call them grandparents, but when they were eight, Richard declared that Rebecca and Martin were parents to them. From that point on, they never had any questions about it. Having had negative experiences with Angie, Rebecca was initially very afraid that her sons would grow up and abandon them. But the boys grew up not only grateful, they loved their parents sincerely. Mom, Dad, we are very grateful to you for what you have invested so much in us, often said the sons, and most of all, thank you for finding the strength and not giving us to an orphanage. The boys came home for a few weeks. They both already had jobs in London and good prospects. Richard, Eugene, their father once said to them, my mother and I don't mind if you choose to stay in London. You are adults and should decide for yourselves what to be and where to live. Martin and Rebecca looked fondly at their sons. Their parents had arranged a festive dinner for them in honor of their diploma defense. Of course, they both realized that they were old. Both of them were to turn 78 this year. Now I can leave in peace, Martin thought. My life hasn't gone to waste. Thank God for the two nuns knocking on my door one day. 